Once, long ago, a group of ponies came together and thought that they realized the truth of their existence in seemingly idyllic Equestria. They saw their princess and what she represented in their eyes, and they wanted to put a stop to it. They thought that the key to this was the surviving human, and they made it their mission to release him. The intentions raised from justice to social progress to a change in sociological structures to simple personal profit. Whatever they wanted from it, though, they believed that the result would be better than what came before. They thought that they were bringing about a change for the better, that their Messiah would burst from the stone and bathe them in light and radiance and promise them a golden age. Oh, how they were wrong. The Beginning of the End Extract from the Life Before the Apocalypse <laughs> The ponies of the Brotherhood now surrounded what was once a statue in the clearing of the other free forest, all backed away slightly. Their hoods were up, and they were gathered in a circle around a large stone platform, which the statue now rested on. The upper half had already shattered, freeing the human soldiers, heads, and parts of his torso, and revealing his face. He was no longer wincing in pain or discomfort. He was now screaming in blind fury. Ah! He raged. Fucking ponies, 1,000 fucking years, I'll kill you all! The wind began to pick up above the Everfree Forest. Clouds began to gather in a spiral around the clearing, with the only clear patch of sky being right above them. A full moon shone down on them, bathing the forest in an unearthly glow. Hold steady, boys, said one of the ponies. We've almost got him. I'll kill you. You're all going to die. The soft glow of the moonlight quickly died out, in favor of a flickering orange tint coming from the trees. Some of the ponies could see the source of the light right away, but Ancient Tome and a few others had turned their heads to see that the forest was ablaze behind them. Don't get discouraged now, every pony, Tome ordered. He'll never get out if we don't complete the spell. Gold coin, add the salts. I'm going to rip your hearts out and show them to you before you die. The yellow earth pony on the other side of the circle began to sweat, but nevertheless, he bent down and gripped a nearby bowl in his mouth. He trotted over to the human in the middle of their circle and poured the salts on the base of the statue. He looked back to Ancient Tome for confirmation. Upon receiving an affirmative nod, he jumped up and rested his forelegs on the statue and poured the salts over the torso area too. The rest of the stone around the torso shattered bring the human's upper body. This unfortunately included his arms. Second reached down and grabbed Gold Coin by the throat. Lifting him up to eye level, the business pony began to choke under the pressure of the human was that the human was applying. Those fingers were stronger than they look. You're going to die, pony! You're going to die for everything you did! Please! He choked out. I'm only trying to help! He gagged. Please, let me go! The human glared angry at him, teeth grinding and eyes bloodshot. Ah! He threw gold coin to the ground at the statue base and began wriggling. As the earth pony scrambled to get away from the middle of the circle, the human began pounding at the lower half of the statue with his fists. Cracks began to appear, and before long, the lower part of the statue shattered as well. The human fell from atop a stone platform and landed on his face less than gracefully. The wind began to die again, and the heat from the forest fire became slightly less intense. The ponies from the Brotherhood all breathed a sigh of relief. The human laid face down in the dirt, unmoving. It was dirt now, anyway. When the ritual began, that was a pile of mud. The magic of the ritual clearly had a drastic effect on the local environment. It was a good thing that they conducted this in the Everfree Forest, after all. Tome stepped forward, using a wave of the hoof to tell the others to get back. My lord, he asked, are you okay? The human remained silent. Taking a chance, the unicorn stepped forward and prodded his body gently. The ancient being made no attempt to respond. He tried to use magic to pull him to his feet. The light purple glow of his horn surrounded the human, but no matter how hard he pulled, it did nothing. Then he remembered that magic did not affect Second. He mentally slapped himself for forgetting one of the core elements of the human legend. I think he's unconscious, said Ancient Tome. Or dead. Could be either one. 
he had better not be dead, said Frosty from underneath her hoof. I fought a dragon to help bring him back. I thought you said you never directly confronted the dragon. It doesn't matter. It's a dragon. I get credit for surviving in the first place. Lowering her hood, Tom's auntie, an elderly purple unicorn, stepped into the middle of the circle to address the rest of the brotherhood. All right, every pony. We've resurrected the most dangerous enemy to have ever lived. Good work. Now, we need to get him someplace safe. That freaky weather just now will have attracted some attention. Unicorn magic doesn't affect him, so I need a Pegasus volunteer who can fly second on their back. I'll do it, said Frosty. Good. Where are we going, Tommy? I don't know, Auntie, the still unicorn replied. Where can we take him? One at Sparkle Manor, Goldcoin replied. For the same reason I didn't host the last meeting there, Ancient Tome snapped. I have a son and a butler back home. If thirteen ponies show up carrying a famous historical figure on their back, they're going to notice. We only need to hide the second, Ironhoof pointed out. If he's dead, then the Brotherhood is going to disband soon anyway. And if he's unconscious, we'll be the ruling body of Equestria before the month is out. I don't think it really matters anymore if ponies know that we're in cahoots. He's right, Tome. There isn't much point in hiding our connections. Fine, he agreed. We'll take Second back to Sparkle Manor. Maybe we can hide him in the basement or something until he's ready to do whatever it is he does. Frosty Morning had already ran over to the human, and two other ponies of the Brotherhood were helping to position him onto the Pegasus's back. Ancient Tome, meanwhile, nodded to one of the other ponies, who underneath his hood, Tome knew as the former Wonderbolt known as Sunrise. Some of the other ponies were surprised when Sunrise ran around, setting all the tents on fire with logs from the campfire. Sunrise, what gives? asked an unidentified mare. He's destroying evidence, Ironhoof explained. Leave him be. Quite right. Celestia stood silently just inside Vault 3G of the Royal Candlelot archives. The door behind her was shattered into tiny pieces, and the ruined chamber was still visible beyond. Normally when she came in here, the princess liked to close the door behind her and get some privacy. Without the door and her back exposed to the chamber beyond, she felt uncomfortable. The elements of harmony laid before her, once again in the shape of five large stone balls. They had been like that for a while now. Their previous avatars long since dead, they were once again useless and forever remain useless until some new avatars were chosen. Such a thing seemed unlikely. The other five were all linked by the element of magic, and that meant a strong magic user was required to be the avatar. And sad to say, after a thousand years of searching, the princess had yet to find a unicorn able to compare to Twilight Sparkle in her prime. That hadn't been a problem as such until today. The last millennium had gone surprisingly without incident. It didn't used to be like that. For a brief while, all that time ago, new threats of of Equestria appeared like clockwork. First it was Nightmare Moon, then Discord, then the Changelings, Slisk, Second and First, Atlantis, the Spider Legion, the Nameless One, T-Rex, and that wasn't even all of them. It was a bizarre decade, and one where Twilight and her other elements of harmony had been the vital tool in saving Equestria multiple times. Then, after Tyrek, it just stopped. No more invasions or supremely powerful beings appeared anymore. The land enjoyed it some peace for once, and it was well received by all. Twilight Sparkle and her friends enjoyed long lives and accomplished great things, and they all left their own legacy. However, the moment the first of them died, their respective element reverted back into a stone ball. The other elements were unchanged but rendered useless. Without the sixth one, and over time, they slowly went gray and changed their shape until all six of them were like that. The element of magic vanished from the world once again. At this time, Celestia hadn't panicked. Equestria had already coped a thousand years without the elements before Luna's banishment, and it could weather this loss as well. However, Equestria survived those years without the elements through lack of major threat, not because they didn't need them. 
and that's exactly how they survived the last thousand years as well. Now, there were not one, but two major threats to the kingdom roaming around out there, and this time with no elements to combat them. The princess sighed as she looked at the lifeless elements, her mind once again wandering to a crisis long since past. Don't worry, princess, you can count on us, Twilight Sparkle said confidently. Whatever the challenge, we'll get through it together. The other five ponies formed a semicircle around her, each wearing their own element necklace to complement Twilight's tiara, and each also displaying confidence in their own way. Applejack and Flourish just smiled. Rarity had her game face on and Pinkie Pie was bouncing up and down excitedly, and Rainbow Dash had a smug grin to end all smug grins. Celestia nodded approvingly at the ponies. She wanted to smile with them and tell them that she said their confidence, but she didn't want to jinx it. It just felt like she should keep a cautious demeanor. It was almost as if she could feel that something was going to go wrong in just a few seconds' time. Very good, she said. Now, you best be on your way. Second and first are quite upset with you. Oh great, these guys. Celestia turned around to face the two. Second was sitting on a throne and was decked out in what appeared to be her spare jewelry. He had her necklace and tiara, and it was all so ill-fitting of him and stupid-looking in general that it took everything she had to remain serious and not burst out laughing. It was like seeing Discord cross-dressing. First was standing next to him and fanning the other human with a giant palm leaf. Where had that even come from? Who knew? Yes, Second continued. Very upset. We're upset, aren't we? Yes, we're upset. I know I'm upset. Are you upset? Yeah, I'm upset. See? He's upset. I'm upset. We're very upset, Princess. Well, what are you upset about? She asked icily. We can't cook, first answered. The Princess blinked. I excuse me? Neither of us know how to cook, Second clarified. I mean, back home we never needed to, but now that we're here and ponies run screaming whenever we enter a restaurant, and we can't cook anything for ourselves, we're both slowly starving to death here. Somebody throw us a bone. Anyone? Celestia just stared. Guards! The dark figure stalked the streets of Canterlot. The moon was hanging low over the overhead sky. It looked both ways down the street for approaching ponies, and then rushed towards the nearby alley. The figure walked short distances and turned a corner, where it soon came upon a dumpster and the back entrance to a restaurant. The creature slinked over to the dumpster and jumped into the air, twisting around and diving headfirst into the pile of garbage as if it were water. A few seconds passed, and the creature's head breached the surface of the muck again, a half-eaten sandwich close between its mouth. It threw it into the air and caught it again, swallowing it in one bite. Sus. He said contently. Hey! Slisk looked around for the source of the noise, and finally settled on a royal guard who was standing just outside the dumpster. The ancient being stared at the guard for a second, who tilted his head at the thing that was currently raking through the garbage around the back of the cheap fast food place. Slisk mimicked the guard as he did, and tried to analyze him. This pony was probably the Canterlot Night Watch. What are you doing in there, you... whatever you are? Uh, he asked. Sliss contemplated killing the guard for a moment, but thought better of it, and decided instead to try to turn the situation around. I was looking for my house key, he said. Yes, house key. The guard stepped back, away from the possessed pony. Okay, he replied. Do you need any help with that? Sliss gave the guard a wide, toothy grin. It was probably not a good idea to show the fact that he had razor-sharp teeth that were completely unnatural to ponies, but from the 30 or 40 seconds he had spent with him, the entity determined that the guard was not the brightest. He had, he had liked to think of himself as a good judge of character. Yes. Thank you, officer. No offense, but you are really creepy. And you smell. The guard raised an eyebrow. Coming from the pony swimming in a dumpster, he pointed out. The creature grinned again. I like you. 
You amuse me. What's your name, Pony? Um... Slisk became nervous for a second and tapped his hoof against his head. He couldn't tell him his real name because he was a famous historical villain, and if he gave him his host's name, that might give him away as well. Looking through his memories, Slisk had determined that Heartbeat was some kind of pony who would be missed. His name was probably all over the news by now, I'm not saying that he had bothered to check. He had to think of a clever lie, and fast. Doctor, um, Fluttershy. Yes, Fluttershy. That's my name. Oh, like the element of kindness? The guard asked. That's pretty cool. Especially if you're a doctor, too. Though, forgive me if I'm wrong, but... Isn't Fluttershy kind of a mayor's name? The entity narrowed his eyes at the guard. Is there something wrong with my name? He hissed. N no nothing wrong with it at all. I just never heard of a cult being named Fluttershy before. Well, what is your name, guard? Broadsword, my good doctor, at your service. Slisk tilted his head thoughtfully. Say, how would you like to assist me in some medical research? Oh, Broadsword replied. Well, I don't know. I'm kind of busy with patrol duty right now, and I don't think I have the time. Sorry. Slisk had an idea. Yes, he said sadly. That is what my parents used to say. Oh. The guard stood there in awkward silence for a moment. He rubbed the back of his neck with a hoof. Um, do you want to talk about it? he asked. The entity gave Brosnan a smile that he hoped looked non-threatening. I would, I would like, like that very much. much. Hey, you almost sound normal when you don't stretch out the S sounds like that. If still a little raspy. Stretch out the S sounds? I don't stretch. I don't stress out my S sounds. Broadsword raised an eyebrow. Are you not aware you're doing that, Doctor? He asked. Doing what? Slisk demanded. I'm, I'm not doing, doing anything. There is nothing wrong with my speech. Yes, there is. You stretch out all your S sounds. I hear you talking and it sounds like a snake hissing. Slisk went quiet. How long had he been speaking like that? Why had Don Pony told him? It was very rare for him to actually feel embarrassed and uncomfortable, especially around mortals. But he felt like that right now. He was not sure he liked it very much. In my defense... I don't really listen to the sound of my own voice. Broadsword smiled at the entity. Hey, don't worry about it, Doc, he said reassuringly. Come on, come walk on my patrol with me. We can talk as we go. The serpentine creature left, leapt almost fifty feet in the air and landed next to Broadsword in the alleyway. The guard stared for a moment, trying to reconcile what he had just seen with his understanding of physics. After trying for half a minute, he shook his head and dismissed it as a unicorn thing, and set off with his new friend in tow. Mystic Chan awoke to the sound of a scuffle. There were voices downstairs. He recognized two in particular, his father and soft-spoken. But there were two others as well. Some of them were familiar to him and some were not. The cult decided to investigate and slipped out of his bed and onto the floor. Sensing he probably shouldn't be up at this hour, he wisely decided to tiptoe to the other side of the room and he had to open the door in a very specific way to stop it from creaking. On the other side of the door, the voices became clear, and you could make out a few more. Uncle Iron was definitely one of the ponies downstairs, and he thought he could just about make us make... He thought he could just about make out the sound of anti-mourning and anti-arts as well. He briefly entertained the thought that it was a family get-together with a few relatives he had never met before. But then he remembered that Ironhoof technically wasn't his uncle, and he just called him that. So that theory was out the window. Sir, I must protest. I had no idea we'd be having this many visitors at such late at night. That was Softy. That's too bad. Prepare the guest bedrooms. Now. That was definitely Father. Sir. Just do it, Softy. I'm not in the mood for this. Mystic Chant retreated into his bedroom, as soft-spoken ascended the stairs and passed by on his way to the guest room. Once he was sure the danger had passed, 
The unicorn stepped out of his room again, approached the banister at the top of the stairs, and peered down through the bars to at the main hall below. It seemed Father had invited more than just family. There were many different kinds of ponies among the group, as well as Father, Iron, Frosty, and Arts. He also recognized a family friend whom he had met once, named Goldcoin, a former racing pegasus named Sunrise, and one pony who he swore had taught him the year before he entered Miss Chalkboard's class. And those were just the ones he recognized. The others were even more diverse. There was a yellow unicorn mare, a middle-aged earth pony stallion, a zebra of unknown gender, one of those bat-like pegasi that the Princess Luna used for her night guard, two light green earth pony mares who were probably twins. Okay, Ancient Tome sighed. He's gone. Good. You can drop the spell now, Chameleon. The yellow unicorn's horn suddenly became duller. Mystic wasn't even aware she was casting a spell in the first place, until her horn had already stopped glowing. As it did, some pony, or something, suddenly appeared on, on Frosty Morning's back. Hide him in the basement, Iron ordered. Care, you go down there and keep an eye on him. Do what you can. One of the green earth pony twins nodded and cantered over the stairs leading to the basement, Frosty Morning and her unknown passenger in tow. They soon disappeared from view and the rest of the group all turned to each other once again. Now, you're all going to be here a while, and since many of you haven't stayed in this house before, let me lay down a few ground rules. One, no enlisting the butler. I don't even like to shout at him, but sometimes it has to be done. If he frustrates you, though, talk to him. He's normally very reasonable. Two, no pony breathe a word about you-know-who to either him or my son. This is supposed to be a secret, with emphasis on secret, and telling them defeats the purpose. 3. No pony goes into my study without permission. If I find any pony wandering in there when they shouldn't, I feed you to the Hydra. 4. And this is important. If any pony is allergic to cats, the entire third floor is off limits to you, for reasons you should probably be able to guess. He paused and looked around at each of them to make sure that they were paying attention and understood. Now that that's out of the way, every pony follow me to the sitting room. We'll discuss things further in there. Ancient Tome led the rest of the ponies out of the main hall through a corridor to the side, probably taking them to the sitting room he had said. The coast clear, the young colt walked down the stairs into the main hall and looked curiously at the small wooden door that led into the basement. The basement was usually ever used for storing old furniture that Father felt was too valuable to throw out, but too old to use for his house. Things only stayed in the basement for a little while before they were eventually put up everything for auction. Mystic's mind wandered at the thought of who could possibly be down there, who could possibly be so important that they had to be hidden down there. What were those ponies keeping secret? Feeling brave, the unicorn trotted over to the door and peered through the keyhole. There was only darkness. Then he remembered that the basement was at the bottom of some stairs, and thus he couldn't have seen anything through that keyhole, even if the lights were on. Stupid. Maybe I'll just go down there and see what it is. The basement's pretty big. I can hide from Auntie Morning and that other pony. Taking a chance, Mystic Chance horn glowed softly, and he pulled the door open slightly. Magic was difficult for him, as it was for most ponies at his age, but he was still slightly better at it than most. Magic was a talent that ran in the family. All of his blood relatives had cutie marks that were based around some kind of magic-related talent. Father's talent was learning new th spells through theory. Auntie's, Auntie Art's talent was discovering and using really old spells and so on and so forth. Naturally, he had fully expected his own cutie mark when it came up to be something magic related. So, he always did his best practicing magic. Here, it seemed it was going to pay off. Mystic tried another spell, and his horn lit up slightly brighter, allowing him to make his way through the darkness. Eventually, he reached the bottom of the stairs, where he found a wide wall with a single regular door in the center. Of course, he had forgotten about the second door. He heard hoofsteps. The little unicorn froze for a second, but quickly regained his wits, and jumped to one side of the door. It opened, and two ponies emerged into the darkness stair into the darkened stairway. Mystic Chant killed the light for a moment as they appeared, but the light pouring in from the basement on the other side kept the stairway lit. So. How long do you think it'll take? Auntie Morning asked the green earth pony. I'm not sure, Frosty, the earth pony replied. 
I'm not even familiar with his biology. It could work completely different than anything in Equestria. I've never heard of one of them falling unconscious before, so I have no frame of references. By the time the Earth Pony had finished his sentence, they were at the top of the stairs, and Frosty was pulling open the door at the top. They had left the door at the bottom open, and mercilessly, neither of them had noticed the cowering unicorn just behind it. Let's just hope it's soon, Frosty replied. I don't want to have to wait a second longer for this. We've waited long enough. The two ponies disappeared behind the door at the top of the stairs, and closed it behind them. The voices became muffled, and soon, it went completely silent. Mystic breathed a sigh of relief, and walked out from behind the door, entering the basement. The whole room was just as it was when he last saw it. In the corner where the old were the old paintings, next to the door were oversized plant pods. By the opposing wall were four beds of different sizes, one of which had a wardrobe and a bedside cabinet stacked on top of it, and one which was built up to ten mattresses high. Over there was an old grate for the fireplace, and opposite from that was a cracked mirror with an ornate frame. In the center of the room was a fancy oak table with, with twelve less than fancy lawn chairs surrounding it, and it had a barbecue just off to the side, sitting there awkwardly like it was invited to a party but nobody really wanted it there. What caught his eye, though, was the figure from earlier, one that Frosty had been carrying. It was laying... He was laying on one of the free beds, stretched across it, chest rising and falling rhythmically. The, in the light of the basement's torches and closer up, he could see that it was definitely not a pony, but it was in fact wearing clothes like ponies. He moved in closer to see what it was. Soon, he stood right next to the bed. He jumped up and placed his hooves on top of it, pulling himself up so that his head was level with the thing on the bed. He got a good look at it, and the color drained from his face as he recognized what it was. The human opened his eyes. Time stood still. The human and the unicorn stared back at each other in silence. Second's eyes were bloodshot while the colts were staring at him as if he had just seen a manticore rip a pony in half right in front of him. Neither of them moved for a moment. Yes, the human said eventually. Who are you? M M Mystic Chant, he replied nervously. Wonderful. Get out of my way, kid, I got a job to do. The little blue unicorn backed away fearfully as the human turned on the bed and placed both of his feet on the floor. He stood up and stretched his arm out above him, arching his back. There was a sickly cracking sound, and the second groaned loudly. Then he leaned forward and yawned. A hand reached into his inner parts of his coat, and he felt around some of his pockets. Gone, he said. Figures. Guess I'll have to get by without it. Second strode over to the door on the other side of the room. Mystic Chant watched as his fingers slid around the handle and pulled it back. He had never seen a door open that way. Wait! He called out. You're Lord Second, aren't you? The human only nodded at him before. That was him! He thought to himself. That was Lord Second! What is he doing here? Did Auntie bring the human back to our house? How did he get out of the statue? Why was he with him? Does father know about this? And yes, while Tom obviously didn't know, the cult was way beyond the point of thinking rationally by now. He had begun hyperventilating. This was not good. This was really not good. Short of Tyrek himself emerging from the depths of Tartarus, this was the worst possible thing that could ever happen. And it happened right in his own home. He had to tell some pony. Slisk and Broadsword approached a small cottage on the lower levels of Canelot together, both in conversation. The sun was rising again, just peeking out from below the lines of the houses in the distance. The watch pony's eyes were slowly drooping more and more at this time, as time passed by. Still, he smiled and nodded, when his new friend made a point. And that is why I never shop there again, Slisk finished. Sounds like a terrible place, Broadsword agreed. I don't know what you were expecting. Neither did I. It was so pointless. Soon, the two stopped in front of the house. Anyway, that's the end of my shift, the guy explained. I'm going, I'm going to go in now. Some, I have something to eat before I go to bed, because this is late at night for me. If you want to stay in for dinner, doctor, you're welcome. My mom makes a nice stew. You still live with your mother? Well, yeah. 
What are you, like, 33 or something? Accommodation is expensive, Broadsword shouted defensively. Slisk rolled his eyes. Fine, I, I can go, go for some stew. Broadsword opened the door and proceeded inside. Slisk was left outside for just a moment alone with his thoughts. Just a momentary distraction. I'll get right back to my plans later. Flowshy, come on, Broadsword called from his other house. It's gonna get cold. Sliss groaned at him. Why did I choose that name? So then I told him I'd eat his children, said the Bat Pegasus. And that convinced him to give back the bike pump. It was too late, though. By the time I got back to the cave, they were already dead. Bloody parties. Some ponies are idiots, said Sunrise. What are you going to do? The rest of the Brotherhood all murmured in agreement. Tea and coffee, any pony? Soft-spoken entered the room, carrying a tray in his mouth. Thirteen cups, three kettles of varying sizes, four sugar pots, three small jugs of milk, all balanced precariously on the tray. Thank you, Softy, Ancient Tome said politely. The old unicorn levitated various cups, pots, jugs, and kettles off the tray and placed them in different locations about the room on different tables or on the chair arms so that every pony could reach their own beverages. Soft-spoken bowed and walked out with the tray. As he closed the door behind him, Railway spoke up. How does he carry a tray that heavy in his mouth? he asked. He has a jaw like a bear trap, Iron replied. That pony could chew through steel if he were so inclined. He just can, Ancient Tome explained. I don't know how. Personally, I think that Jaw got so strong because of all the talking he does. When he was younger, Softy used to do all sorts of diplomatic stuff. He was an ambassador, a negotiator of several other things. Hmm. So, anyway, Dump continued, I think it's about time we start making plans. So, what are we going to do now that the human is free? What do you mean, we? asked the Bat Pegasus. We don't have to do anything. Second should be able to take down the princess and her army all by himself. He's got the means and the motive for it. Why not just wait for him to do it? Then when he's done, he'll seek us out and will reward us accordingly. That's assuming an awful lot, argued Frosty. What if he doesn't want to find and reward us? What if he expects us to do our part in freeing Equestria? Would he want us, though? asked Railway. He never had any pony followers before. Yes, but he had Lord First before, one of the green earth ponies replied. He's alone now. Do you really think he can't handle it alone? asked Railway. I mean, think about it before... The doors opened suddenly. The ponies of the Brotherhood all turned their heads to see Mystic Chant run into the room panting, a look of terror on his face. Human! he shouted. There's a human in the basement! He just ran out the door! There's a human in the basement! all shared a look for a split second before they all jumped out their chairs and stampeded for the doors. Mystic barely had time to jump out of the way and of, to avoid being trampled by the crowd. The last one left in the room was his father, Ancient Tome, who was also panicking. Without saying a word to Mystic, he enveloped him in a purple glow and rushed out the door, too, dragging his son through the air behind him. Celestia entered the throne room and approached the far end where one night guard and one day guard stood side by side at the base of the raised platform holding the actual throne, which Princess Luna was vacating. Morning, Luna, Celestia said cheerfully. Morning, Tia, her sister returned. Listen, I hate to bring bad news, but last night a weather team near Ponyville sent us a report about unusual activity in Everfree. Celestia became worried. How unusual, she asked. Luna's horn glowed, and her brown envelope floated down from the throne. She held it up in front of her sister and pulled out several pages, which she reshuffled in the air and handed over to her sister. Celestia paused for a moment, giving Luna an odd look before looking over them. The photos showed an ever, the forest showed in a forest fire, and what appeared to be the beginning of a somehow naturally occurring hurricane as well. A photo of the sky showed a circle of clouds spiraling above Equestria, the moon visible through the eyes of the storm and the trees burning the forest below. I sent on a team to investigate, 
the younger sister continued. But they found only the ashes there. I have no idea what's going on, and they have only recently returned, so I haven't had time to go through it all. Maybe you'll have more luck. Thank you, sister. A pony blinked his eyes. He looked ahead of him. He was staring into the face of something that was distinctly not a pony. You're in Equestria, just outside Canterlot, the other creature replied. I'm Second. Pleased to meet you. The pony held out a hoof to Second's gesture of goodwill. Pleased to meet you, he returned. Second grabbed his hoof and shook it. His fingers felt weird. Who am I? the pony asked. Why, you're Exploding McGee, of course. You're an extremely powerful unicorn, and your special talent is exploding like a bomb whilst being able to survive, see? He pointed to the Earth Pony's flank. Explody turned his head and saw he, that his cutie mark depicted in the explosion on several body parts and several pony body parts flying around at it, including a still smiling unicorn head. You were born to two parents, Mr. Exploder and Voltorb. You're currently working as a professional demolition pony just off a contract in Trottingham. You're 27 years old and it's... You're right, he cried happily. I can't believe I forgot that. I must have had a freaky case of sudden amnesia there. Thank you, Mr. Second. You've really saved my life. And you're also very handsome and charming. Why, yes. Yes, I am. But enough of how... But enough of how... About how amazing I am. You have a job to do, right? Explody gasped. Oh, Celestia, you're right. I was commissioned to destroy the annex of Canterlot Castle today. I'll be late. Don't worry, said Second. If you recall... You were taught magic by no less than the ghost of the great and powerful Trixie herself, who taught you how to teleport long distances effortlessly. Oh yeah, I remember that now. I'm not going to be late after all. Thanks, Second. You really helped me out today. Don't mention an explody, Second replied cheerfully. Just have fun with the job, and say hi to the princesses for me. I haven't gotten to see them in so long. Will do. Thanks again. There was a flash of light, and the unicorn vanished. Left alone in the in the rundown house, Second pulled up a chair and sat on the table. Now we play the waiting game. I'm sorry, could you repeat that? Agent Ohm rubbed a hoof against the floor innocently. We released the human from his statue, intending to overthrow Celestia with him. The rest of the Brotherhood of Man were all gathered behind him, silently. Soft-spoken and missing chant stood aside stood stood side by side and just stared at Tom for a second. All right, soft spoken side. I've got to ask why why in Equestria would you ever do that? Ancient Tom winced. He knew it was bad when some pony named Soft Spoken was shouting at you. To free the land he shouted back. Equestria has been held in an iron grip of the Sun Tower for centuries. These ponies have been Wait, 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 Softy stopped him. Sun Tyrant? Is that what this is? A revolutionary thing? Are you guys... Did you... All these years and I... Dear Luna, you ponies are idiots. You don't understand, Softy, Tom continued. You can't see the web of lies that those princes have crafted to protect us. Though we have the illusion of freedom, we... No, the butler interrupted again. I don't care. I've heard all this tripe before. You damn conspiracy theorists have been spouting this stuff about Celestia being a tyrant for years. This kind of talk was considered stupid back in the Dark Ages. How there exist as many as thirteen of you, I will never know, because I refuse to believe there exist that many ponies who are that kind mon who are that mind bogglingly stupid. Awkward silence. Well, when you put it like that. Shut up, Tome, soft spoken snapped. You've all lost the right to speak at all. I'm going to send a letter to Canterlot immediately informing the royal guard of what you did, and with any luck, the princess will stop the human before the apocalypse descends on Equestria. And if you're lucky, you'll all spend the rest of your days in the dungeon somewhere instead of off on the moon where you belong. The old stallion turned to leave the grounds. I'm afraid I can't let you do that, Softy. He turned around to face the Brotherhood again and found that Ancient Tome was, levit Ancient Tome was levitating a large black lump of metal in front of him. Do you know what this is? Mystic's eyes widened. No, Dad, he shouted, jumping in front of the brown earth pony. You can't use that on him. Get out of the way, son. No, 
Move, boy. No! Chameleon stepped in at this point to help out. Effortlessly, the yellow matter levitated the young colt away and began kicking and screaming. But he couldn't fight back. But he could not fight back. And soon, he was stuck floating just above the ground in a small yellow prison right next to his father. Now, softy, Ancient Tome said calmly, we're both way too old for this now. Speak for yourself, sonny, Soft replied. You are at least half my age, but you act like you're my senior. I'll never understand that. And you have way too much self-pity that you're completely undeserving of. You think a white mane and a few wrinkles make you old? You're still in your prime, and look at me. Most ponies my age are in care homes right now, and I still have to lug around all those massive trays of coffee for you. All things considered, I think I'm doing very well. Tom snorted. Softy, insulting me is going to get you nowhere, he replied. Now, you've been a loyal servant for many years. I respect that, and I don't want to cut your life short because we're having a difference of opinion. In a month, maybe a week, me and the Brotherhood will have this country, and you'll see what a paradise it can be when every pony is truly free. You're a nut job! This is not a difference of opinion, this is a case of right and wrong, and you are wrong! Tome frowned. You're going to be held in the basement under lock and key, the unicorn explained. We will take care of you and provide for you, and you'll be safe there while the revolution passes you by. Once it's over, you'll be free to go, and you can enjoy the whole new world. Yeah, a smoldering crater and yellow sky. Lock him up. The two remaining unicorns in the group, one of them a gray stallion with a, cook, with a book cutie mark, and the other a lavender mare the mystic knew as Auntie Arts, both lit up their horn and lifted softly into the air. Their magical auras mixed together and formed a deep purple around his body. They both headed towards the hit, towards the house, and the elderly stallion was pulled along with them. Softy! Mystic cried. You're not going to get away with this tome! Soft spoken shouted. You're a mad pony, and you're doomed to fail! Keep telling yourself that, old friend. Soon, the two unicorns and their prisoner disappeared in the house, leaving the remaining members of the Brotherhood outside. You're a monster! Mystic shouted. Tom looked down at Mystic. I am your father, you little ingrate! He snapped. I've taken care of you since you were smaller than your head is right now. I don't want you to ever disobey me again. Is that clear? The little unicorn glared up at his father. Yes, sir. Good. Chameleon, take him up to his room and lock him there. Windows as well and sent up an anti-magic field so it can't break out. I'm not taking any chances. Tom's minion nodded in understanding, and carried off her charge towards the mansion. Ancient Tom was left alone, outside, holding the, ancient, holding the reaper's horn, and being stared at by the remaining ponies. He looked at the rest of them. What? he asked. Damn, Tommy, said, ancient, said Ironhoof. That was harsh. Well, what did you want me to do? Tom said defensively. I don't know, but threatening a senior citizen with a god killer is low. Really low. And I don't like the way you spoke to your kid, either. I, Iron, you saw what he was doing. It doesn't matter, Frosty interrupted. You just don't do that. I have an elderly father and a filly of my own at home, and I would never even consider threatening them like that. How you just threaten Mystic and Softy, Iron's right. That is low. Frosty turned and spread her wings, taking off towards the house and flying towards the upper window. Tom looked first to Iron Hoof, who just turned and walked away without saying another word, and then the rest of the Brotherhood. Well, he said, is that what you all think too? You disgust me, said Goldcoin. He turned and trotted away back towards the house, and most of the others followed him, while the others left the grounds altogether. Soon, Tome was all alone. Exploding McGee smiled happily to himself as he entered Celestia's throne room. The princess was reading through a document and discussing something with a mare in his suit and tie at the moment, but both of them went silent as a strange unicorn entered the room and sat down at the base of the steps, leading up to the throne right next to the suited pony. Um, 
Uh, hello, said the princess. Who are you? I'm Exploiting McGee, your majesty, he exclaimed. You hired me to demolish the annex. I never asked for anything of the sort, Celestia replied. Who sent you? Exploiter lost a smile immediately. You mean, you, you don't want me? He asked tearfully. But it's been my dream to explode for you ever since I was a little colt. No, I, I didn't mean that. I'm just saying that I, I'm sorry. Jade, can we do this another time? I've got a situation. The mare in the suit took one look at the blubbering unicorn next to her and shrugged. She picked up her suitcase in her teeth and galloped out of the room without a word, leaving only the princess and the strange visitor. Are you all right? she asked. F f ah, fine, your majesty, he sobbed. Oh boy, Celestia thought to herself. I haven't needed to do this in a while. The princess walked over and laid down next to the pitiful wreck of a unicorn and placed a wing over him like a, he was a foal. Let it never be said that I don't care for my subjects. There, there, stop crying, she said gently. It's all okay. There's just been a bit of confusion. I forgot you were coming, though, if it's all right with you, I need to ask you about this job if you're going to do it. She had to be careful here. Explody, for his part, seemed to perk up a bit on hearing when he was going to get to do the job, and he smiled at the alicorn. I was, sent, I was sent by equestrian demolition, he explained, drying his eyes. They said that I had a call from you asking for a pony who could demolish the annex. I was sent because I'm the best bomb pony they had. You'll never see any pony who explodes as well as I do. You mean you're good with explosives? No, I mean explode. I mean I explode better than any pony else. The unicorn clarified. As in, you are the explosive. Yep, that's why they call me Explody McGee. He leapt back on his hooves, and the princess stood up again too. Um, how are you alive? Celestia looked at the stallion's cutie mark. It was indeed an exploding pony. I'm going to be honest with you, Explody, she said cautiously. I've never heard of any pony who could do that at all. Then I guess I'm the first then. The pony was back to being cheery and happy again now. She walked around so that she could see him face to face. Uh, huh. Who is your boss? Who sent you on this contract, if I may ask? I don't know. We just call him Brick because he has a red face and a square head. I never learned his real name. He called me into his office this morning and told me what I would be doing. And then I was off. I'm not sure what happened after that. I got a bit sidetracked and I got a case of temporary amnesia, but fortunately some guy came along and helped me remember everything, and now it's all cool again. Temporary amnesia, the princess echoed. How? Why? Who helped you? I still don't remember how I got it in the first place, but I remember everything before that just fine. Some guy called Second was there to remind me what I was meant to do. He told me to tell you to say hi. Do you guys know each other? Celestia's eyes widened. Explody, she said darkly. I'm afraid there's a very serious problem. Hello, dearie, a squeaky voice called from the next room. How was your shift? Just fine, mommy, Broadsword replied. I brought my new friend Fluttershy home, if it's alright for him to stay for dinner. A green pegasus appeared in the doorframe, with white hair and glasses, and smiling serenely. There were a few cooking pots balanced on her back, supported by her wings, and she was clutching a wooden spoon in her mouth. Oh, hello there, she said. Slisk stood still. Don't say anything stupid. Think, Think of something. something. Oh, well, that's nice, dearie, the old man replied. I hope you like stew. I made stew today. Normally I just cook for me and sword. But there's plenty here for a third pony. Stew is a most succulent meal. They don't make stew black on, back on planet Z I mean, back in Manhattan, he said with shifty eyes. Really? Mrs. Sword asked. I lived in Manhattan for a while, and there was always a good stew to be found if you knew where to look. I guess I was unlucky. How, was she, how did she not notice my teeth yet? They're massive and pointy. Is she blind? Should I ask? 
Well, anyway, Fluttershy, go take a seat on the table. At the table. I'll get you a bowl and some utensils. Doctor Fluttershy, Bratz were corrected. Oh, you're a doctor. That's interesting. My late husband was a doctor, too. We'll have a lot to talk about when dinner's ready. Slisk sighed internally. From now on, I will think of all my clever lies in advance. Or I could delve into some of this fellow's memories and see if there's anything that might help me out. He is an actual doctor, after all. Slisk closed his eyes and concentrated, descending into the depths of his host's mind. Oh, please, somebody help me. I can't move. Please, somebody hear me. I'm stuck inside my own head and there's something controlling me. Oh, dear Celestia, somebody help. Slisk pulled out. Or oh, not. Come on, Duck. Sit down already. Mystic Chan sat in his room awkwardly, laid on the bed, staring at the wall. By the door, the huge zebra from earlier was blocking it, sitting on his rump and staying as still as a statue. It was almost uncanny how he did that. Out of the bedroom, the unicorn tried to make conversation. So, what's your name? Zizar. He sat up and stuck his hoof in his ear, checking for wax. What? Zizar. He was making a clicking sound with his tongue between the Z and the Zar. Mystic had to wonder how that worked. How did any pony ever end up with a name with a clicking sound in the middle of it? How do you... It's spelled with an exclamation mar mark. Z Zar replied automatically, as if he got the question all the time. Where did its zebra kin? Are all? No, my mother was just very cruel. Are you? No, I was born in Equestria. My family just had a thing for traditional zebra names. Do you? Yes, I have this conversation all the time, but I don't mind it. It's just a tad predictable. Well, what do you want to? I'd rather not talk, actually. Tom told me not to. Saw apology accepted. There was a knocking at the door. Z, Zar, moved aside as it opened, and, a, and that yellow earth pony that Mystic Chan knew as gold coin entered. Thomas says I'm to relieve you, he exclaimed. Z, Zar, gave him a cynical look. Thomas orders. The zebra seemed to accept that and left. Goldcoin looked down the hallway at him as he left, and then stepped inside from the door. Come on, kid, let's move, he said. Mystic was surprised, but didn't question it. He got off the bed and ran over to Goldcoin's side. The earth pony locked the door behind him as if they were... Oh, the earth pony locked the door behind him as they ran through the corridor and galloped over the stairs. What's going on? the uncle asked. Is father letting me go? Kid, I don't know if you noticed, but your father's a dick, Goldcorn replied. I'm not putting up with him anymore. You and I are going to set free Mr. Spoken, and then we're going to get out of here. But what about the Reaper's horn? What about it? You can't just let him have it. He could use it against the princesses. Good. I may be abandoned in his brotherhood, but I still hope that those nags meet their end. If Lord Second plans to kill them, more power to him. But that's wrong, Mystic argued. The princesses are the most wonderful ponies ever. They look after the kingdom, raise the sun and the moon for us, and they're always here to protect us. And they could they and they care about every pony. Laz, Laz, and propaganda, Golcorn replied. You think a pony that powerful has any time for any in, or any interest in mortals like ourselves? But kid, when we're out of here, you and I are going to discuss our worldviews. Your father never told you about the existence of the Brotherhood because he thought you were too young to comprehend what we stand for. Speaking from experience, though, I know to give you cult more credit than that. Once we're all gone, we'll sit down and have an open, frank discussion about why you're wrong and why we are totally justified in releasing an eldritch creature to kill us, a seemingly benevolent princess. He said this completely without irony, which was worrying. They came to the basement door, but found it already open. Looking down inside, they saw the bottom of the door was open as well. Treading lightly, gold coins stepped down the stairs with the blue unicorn following close behind. Upon entering the basement proper, they saw something they never expected to see. Arcane arts and sharp mind, the two unicorns that escorted the butler to the basement before, both laid on the bed, nearby fast asleep. They didn't even look like they were knocked out. They were literally asleep. 
Nailed to the nearby wall, Gold Coin spotted a note. Dear sir, I resign. Soft-spoken. Screaming filled the air above the southern port town of Pony Harbor. The Hydra was laying waste at the docks. The beast roared angrily and brought a scaled foot down on one of the piers, which shattered into tiny pieces of wood under the force. A sailor on the pier got away just in time to escape sinking into the ocean. The Hydra didn't like that, and one of its head pursued the pony along the rest of the pier, while the other two picked up a nearby fishing trailer with and checked the horizon behind them for signs of any counterattack respectively. The left head drew back to launch the trawler, and the right head stretched its neck as long as possible in pursuit of its meal, satisfied that nothing was coming to stop it. Meanwhile, the Hydra's middle head turned back towards the town in front of them, and found its view blocked by a scaly underbelly of a massive purple dragon that seemed to appear out of nowhere. The heads all immediately ceased their action and drew back so that they were all side by side once again. The left dropped the fishing trawler as it did, which splashed loudly in the harbor. The three all looked up in unison to see their new opponent. The dragon stood at least double the height of the hydra, with huge green fins on top of his head, and fangs that were evidently too big for his mouth. At least one hung out and rested on his lip. He glared down angrily at the hydra. So, you think you can just walk into this town and start destroying things? The dragon wasn't even shouting. His voice was just naturally loud and booming. The Hydra shrunk down upon hearing it, ducking down as low as possible and covering and cowering like a child that had just been caught stealing from the cookie jar. The dragon didn't wait for any further response or follow-up. Instead, he just reached out with a huge clawed hand and grabbed the Hydra by all three of its throats at once, and lifted it into the air. He turned around and pointed the Hydra to the rest of the town. Say you're sorry, he ordered. The Hydra's heads looked nervously at each other for a second. We're sorry, said the cindered head. Yeah, we're real sorry. We didn't mean it, guys, the left head agreed. We just had a bad day. Please forgive us, the right added. The three heads all turned to look back up at the dragon again and gave him an awkward smile which they hoped looked genuinely remorseful. That's better. I hope you don't try this again. You could have hurt some pony. The dragon pulled the hydro away from the town and dropped him in the sea just outside the harbor. The impact of the massive beast hitting the water caused huge ripples which crashed against the side of the docks. But he was over quickly and no pony else seemed to be hurt for now. No. You three get out of here. I don't want I don't want to catch you causing trouble here again. You don't want to end up like your Uncle Tommy, do you? No, the left head protested. We don't want to end up like Uncle Tommy. We'll be good, we promise. Good. No. Scat. The Hydra took the hint and dove back underwater, swimming away back towards the open ocean. Content that he had successfully averted a crisis, Spike turned around to face the town of Pony Harbor, who cheered loud enough that mainland Equestria could probably have heard it. Spike raised both hands in the air and basked in the praise of the grateful townsfolk, but was quickly interrupted by a voice next to his ear. Excuse me, the voice said in a quiet whisper. I'm looking for Spike the Eternal. The massive dragon turned toward the source of the noise. A cream-colored pegasus mare flew out of the way just in time to avoid getting hit by a snout. She was wearing a little blue hat and, was, and had a mailbag slug over her neck. She smiled nervously at him. You found him. Meanwhile, far away from all the drama occurring elsewhere, Second walked into the front door of an old run-down cottage in the middle of the countryside. He stared up at the opposing sight of the huge mountain before him, atop which he could see Canterlot and the castle it was built around. He needed to get up there. He would need transport. Hmm, he said to himself. Time for me to work on my masterpiece. The human cracked his fingers and reached into the pocket in the side of his coat. He drew out a pencil. Looking around, he found a nearby tree stump and sat on it. He held up his hands and formed them into a square window shape so he could see the landscape through it. Once he had a good view, he held up the pencil in the air. This is for you, Anthony. <laughs>